Welcome to episode 35 of the Mutant Blitz Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Hennig. On this edition of the podcast, we're going to get into Bryce Harper joining the Phillies, some thoughts on that addition to the Philadelphia Phillies, and also a little bit of perspective on why it took so long. Plus, Netflix has officially canceled all future seasons of any Marvel television shows. We'll get into why that happened. George St. Pierre retires from mixed martial arts. I'll discuss his place in mixed martial arts history, NBA TV ratings, CW superhero show ratings, and more here on this episode of the Mutant Blitz Podcast. Topic number one on this episode of the Mutant Blitz Podcast, Bryce Harper officially on Thursday afternoon has finally ended the four months of drag out wondering where he was going to go. Well, according to multiple reports, he is joining the Philadelphia Phillies on a 13 year, $330 million contract, the largest total value contract in North American sports history. Now, Harper's contract is not exactly what people would expect because of the fact that its annual value is not as high as other players. On average, the annual value is roughly the 14th most in Major League Baseball. So for a top, a guy, a guy who is a top three to five player in the Major League Baseball, he is getting, you could consider possibly underpaid. According to Jeff Passan of ESPN, the breakdown goes like this. For 2019, he's going to get $10 million with a $20 million signing bonus. And then from 2020 to 2028, he'll make $26 million a year. And then the final three years of his contract, he will make $22 million each of those seasons. And when you break it down, it comes off as legitimately a reasonable contract for a guy who is coming into the 2019 season at 26 years old. So by the end of the contract, he'll be 39, and he'll have played the remainder of his career for the Philadelphia Phillies in a ballpark that's dimensions are well-suited for his skill set. We've seen hitters like Jim Tomey, Ryan Howard, and Chase Utley have a lot of success in Citizens Bank Park. And the biggest difference between Harper and Tomey, when Tomey came to Philadelphia, the Citizens Bank Park, he was in his early 30s. Harper's coming in at 26, around the same age when Ryan Howard first came on to the big, on the big league scene and exploded and became one of the most feared hitters in baseball. The reason why this was a four-month saga comes down to a major disconnect. And I'm going to touch on both of those disconnects here. There was a, there's a disconnect between players and teams and between fans and baseball players. Let's first touch on the disconnect between players and teams. Baseball over the last 20 years has fallen further and further from the top ranks financially among the major sports. It first was a very slow slide, and it seemed like baseball might stabilize itself and grow. But as time went on, the NFL has absolutely exploded financially, and the NBA, despite nine years ago being in a lot of financial peril, since then has grown into a multi-billion dollar business where every franchise in the NBA is now worth a billion dollars. So every NFL franchise worth a billion dollars, every NBA franchise worth a billion dollars. Both of those sports entities are grossing billions, tens of billions of dollars, and they're netting billions of dollars as well. Baseball, not so fortunate. Baseball has been losing some money when it comes to attendance, when it comes to marketing, and when it comes to things like merchandise sales. Also, TV ratings have gone down, and baseball has become less of a national sport, but more of a regional sport. And as a result, despite the escalating contract values, there are more and more teams that are less interested in committing big money long term because they don't have the money beyond 2022 to say, I'm sure that we're going to have that money. Unless you're a team like the Yankees, a team like the Dodgers, the Padres, the Giants, the Phillies, and the Cubs, 
you're not fully sure what your revenue stream is going to look like over the next 10 years. I isolate those teams because those are among the teams with the largest television regional contracts in all of baseball. Padres, Giants, Dodgers, Phillies, Cubs, along with the Rangers and the Yankees have gargantuan long-term regional television contracts that pay them an absorbent amount of money and allows them to guarantee a certain number for their bottom line financially to run the organizations. Beyond those beyond those teams, there is a bunch of other organizations that are have uncertainty beyond 2022. Why is that? Because 2022 is the collective bargaining agreement. And while Rob Manfred, the commissioner of baseball, is trying to position baseball on an angle where they're not going to force any changes for things such as the pitch clock, the universal designated hitter idea. They're not going to force these ideas, even though they could unilaterally make these changes. They're saving them for the CBA negotiations in a couple years. And as a result, baseball is trying to show the players that they're not willing to overstep or be dictators. They want to be more partners with them because they understand looking at the NFL and looking at the NBA, that if baseball is going to keep making money, they have to work with the players. The problem is the players don't fully understand the financial state that baseball is in. The players just see the billions of dollars that baseball is making off their TV contracts, and they want a larger piece of the pie. Understandably so. Baseball players say people turn on the games to watch us. They're not turning on the games to watch just any baseball game. And the numbers back that up. You look at attendance in minor league ballparks. You look at attendance at college baseball games. You look at attendance at high school baseball games. Baseball is not America's pastime anymore. Football is the king when it comes to sports. People will go watch almost any football. Look at the Alliance of American Football TV ratings. Very healthy. Half a million people watching almost every game at minimum each week. Baseball, they can't guarantee those numbers for every game. And since baseball season is so excessively long compared to the NFL, the NFL being a 16-week game regular season with a one-month-long postseason, baseball on the flip side is a season where spring training starts at the end of February and the World Series is at the end of October. So you have one sport that spans nine months And you have another sport that is condensed between its preseason to postseason to about six months and change. So baseball has not been able to capitalize on the concept of less is more. So baseball owners are not willing to go beyond the CBA if they can't guarantee a certain amount of money is going to be coming in. Because with dwindling attendance all across the leagues in many locations... People are trying to get creative. And one of the creative ways they're trying to do it is a team at the Colorado Rockies. Yeah, they give Nolan Nolan Arenado, their start third baseman, a big contract extension that pays him the most annual salary per year. There's an opt-out clause after three years. So both sides could potentially get out of the deal. Manny Machado, 10-year, $300 million contract signed with the Padres, but there's an opt-out after five years. These teams understand that the market can change in a few years. The players say that they're worth X value. The owners say, we don't really know if we want to pay you that because we don't know if that money is going to be there beyond the next few years. And the problem is is that these agents like Scott Boris, who is the agent for clients, Bryce Harper, Dallas Keuchel, and others, is telling the players, you're worth X number of dollars at X number of years. And teams are saying, yeah, I'm not going to give you X number of dollars. How about Y? And top boards say, well, X doesn't equal Y. And as a result, you have these long, long stalemated holdouts until you finally get an agreed to a deal like Bryce Harper does on February 28th, four months into baseball's free agency. Approximately four months since the end of of the 2018 World Series. So Bryce Harper showed you, though, 
that what he wanted was a commitment for a number of years more than a specific financial commitment. Not saying that $26 million a year is anything to sneeze at, but it also should be noted that Bryce Harper has no opt-out in his contract, a no-trade clause. He wants to be in Philadelphia until the very end of his career, or at least until the age of 39. And the money was not the stumbling point. It was the number of years. Now, the disconnect between fans and baseball and their players is that fans have a perception that their favorite player is only worth X number of dollars. They say, is Bryce Harper really worth $330 million? I don't think so. And they give you all these stats. Why? And these are the same thing for all sports. People look at Le'Veon Bell demanding his money. Is he Le'Veon Bell really worth the money he's getting? They look at a guy like Jimmy Butler of the Sixers. Is he really a max contract player? And the thing that gets overlooked very often when it comes to these players is the fact that sports is not about just what you can do on the field. In professional sports, it's about your marketing potential for the organization to recoup that money outside of the lines. You see merchandise sales, ticket sales, marketing, all the other things that go along with making money. The business of sports is just as, if not more valuable to these franchises than what the players are actually doing on the field. Now, a player being successful in the field obviously makes him more marketable, helps you sell more tickets, and helps you sell more merchandise. But at the end of the day, if a player at least gets you to a certain level of success, whether it's in terms of wins or in terms of you know their individual accomplishments, the team will meet the goals that it has financially, if not exceed them. Bryce Harper's not making... $330 million just because he's entering the prime of his career as a baseball player at 26 and he's a former National League MVP. They're paying him $330 million because last season when the Phillies spent half of the year in first place in the National League, they couldn't get anybody to come to the ballpark. Some nights it looked, some days it looked like there were five, 8,000 people in the stands. Citizens Bank Park, the place that sold out for a consecutive streak that is considered a record in baseball. During the Phillies' heyday from 2007 to 2011, people were flooding the park because they wanted to see Howard, they wanted to see Rollins, they wanted to see Utley, they wanted to see Hamels, they wanted to see Cliff Lee, Roy Halladay. They weren't just coming out to see the Phillies. You see, attendance in sports is about going to the hot ticket item. You think all the people who go to the Warrior games out in Golden State are going there because of the Warriors? No, because it's the place to be seen. It's the place to meet people. It's the hot ticket item in town. You think every person who goes to every Sixers game when they're selling out night after night are going there because of the fact that Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons? No, half of them are there because Sixers are the hot ticket item in town. They want to be where the popular people are. They want to be seen with certain people. They want to be at the place that everybody is going to. If the most popular thing in Philadelphia was to go see the Philadelphia Flyers, more people will go see the Flyers. Sports is about box office appeal when it comes to the dollars and cents of the business of sports. So fans don't understand that when you're paying Bryce Harper or you're paying a Jimmy Butler or you're paying these athletes, it's not about how much you think they're worth for their performance on the field, but the teams are also paying them for what they can do for them at the box office, merchandise sales, etc. That's why Bryce Harper gets $330 million because now the fans who are the casual, the intermediate will show up to more games, buy more jerseys, buy more merchandise, buy more concessions because Bryce Harper is there. Not, they're not going there because a doable Herrera is a one-time all-star. They're not going there because they just love the Phillies. You can stay home and watch the game, but if you want to experience the game now, with Bryce Harper at bat hitting a big home run, you got to be in the building to experience that. So that's why you pay Bryce Harper that $330 million. You're paying for the whole package, what he does for you on 
and off the field. Topic number two on the episode 35 edition of the Mutant Bliss podcast. Netflix has officially announced they have canceled all future seasons of any Marvel-related characters. That includes Daredevil, Iron Fist, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, and The Punisher, as well as the crossover series known as The Defenders. And people saw this coming. It's it's an end of an era. It's a little disappointing. And it it seems like net, the Netflix Marvel slash Disney relationship was never as amicable and as mutually beneficial as everyone had hoped. If you go back in time, when they first came out with the Daredevil TV show before they came out with the other characters, the idea was that Marvel was, for lack of a better term, leasing their characters for Netflix to continue to build their library of programming. Netflix, for a while now, has tried to stay ahead of the curve when it came to the digital versus linear television watching experience. And the belief was is that they could capitalize the plethora of fans who have been going to watch these movies, the plethora of fans who either have rediscovered comics or are much open, more open about their love of comics. And what's happening is, is that Netflix said, we can produce a quality of program that will keep people coming back and watching these shows. And what Netflix did is they took the concepts that were used for their own shows like House of Cards or for major premium network shows like the Ray Donovans and Power and these other shows that are on the HBO Stars and Showtime platforms. They took those ideas and that style of programming and built it around these characters from the Marvel Universe. So as a result, these Marvel characters were able to grow within the show, grow as superheroes, and it allowed Marvel and Netflix to explore more in depth of the who behind the characters. Aside from being extremely well done, Shows like Daredevil and Jessica Jones and Luke Cage were just consumed in large quantities and people loved what they were getting from those characters. But Netflix and Marvel hit a wall with the Iron Fist character. Not as much because it was poorly done. I think that some of the re people who have reviewed Iron Fist don't actually understand the character and maybe not have a full grasp of what Marvel was trying to do with that character. In some ways, Iron Fist was a bridge character. He was helping you get to the Defenders crossover series and expanding on a part of the, the Marvel Street Hero universe that involves something that you hadn't seen before. But it wasn't very well received in terms of viewers and in terms of ratings by critics. So what did Marvel do? Marvel said, all right, Netflix, get rid of that director. We're going to refocus our efforts on Daredevil and Jessica Jones and Luke Cage and push Iron Fist to the back burner a little bit. Well, Daredevil introduced the Punisher in its second season. That was extremely popular. Punisher gets his own show. Jessica Jones, another phenomenal season. Luke Cage, very good season, but not as well accepted. It seemed like the number of people watching the Marvel and Netflix shows was starting to wane. Now, Netflix felt that this may be because of the fact that people are maybe getting tired of the program or maybe it wasn't as well received as the first initial seasons. Marvel probably was looking at it more from a comic book perspective because they are a comic book business. They looked at it and say, look, you know, sometimes, you know, you can have a string of comics that are maybe not as popular as another string of comics. But Netflix was spending a lot of money on production costs. They were spending a lot of money on producing this content that Marvel was basically reaping most of the benefits from. And as a result, something that was supposed to be a major benefit for both entities was turning out to be more of a benefit for Marvel than it was for Netflix in the long run. Netflix initially saw a boom of subscribers, a boom of viewers, a, bu a boom of of people consuming this content. When that number, when those numbers stopped booming, 
and leveled off, and in some cases, for a couple of the shows, dwindled. Netflix showed it as an opportunity to cut their losses ahead of the fact that Disney is coming out with their own digital streaming platform in early 2020. Netflix has built their own library of programming to compete with the other digital streaming platforms and to compete with linear television. So if you don't want to watch what's on the CBS, ABC, Fox, and ABC networks, you don't have to. You can go to Netflix. But what Netflix has done is they've also raised their subscription prices with the understanding that with more and more people cutting the cable, cutting the cord and ditching cable and dish networks, they felt this was an opportunity for them to take advantage of a potential opening to make more money. The problem is this will backfire in Netflix space in the long run. Once people have consumed the final seasons and episodes of the Marvel shows that maybe they haven't gotten to because, you know, life happens. People are busy. People have multiple shows are watching. When Disney comes out with their new platform in 2020, people are going to be going to the Disney Plus platform because where Netflix was the place to go for every Marvel movie. So when Doctor Strange and Avengers Infinity War, for example, were done on their theater run, they came to Netflix before they got to the HBO, Stars, Cinemax, and those other television networks. They were getting the Netflix before they were made available for free to watch on Xfinity and DirecTV and Dish On Demand services. So as a result, Netflix had a corner of the market. That corner of the market is now going to disappear. It's going to go to the Disney Plus platform. So... In 2020, when the second Spider-Man movie is going to be made available for digital download and on Blu-ray, it's not going to go first to Netflix. It's going to go first to Disney+. And that's where Netflix is going to start losing subscribers. Now, Disney, because part of their 21st Century Fox purchase was not just for the studio's and getting back the Marvel the rights to X-Men and Fantastic Four, but it's also Disney getting now minority ownership of Hulu. So Disney now has stake in Hulu, which is a rival of Netflix. It is not in Disney's interest to keep fueling Netflix producing content for them anymore. It's more beneficial for them to put it either on Hulu or on Disney+. Plus. So this is, a, this is a relationship that is not just no longer mutually beneficial. It's going to be extremely one-sided and against Netflix business interest. So that's the reason why those characters in those shows are no longer to be produced on Netflix. Now, we don't know if eventually Marvel will take the rights to those characters back and recontinue those series or maybe come up with some sort of agreement with Netflix to take on their shows from Netflix and put them on Disney Plus or Hulu. We don't know what's going to happen with that yet. I assume that Netflix is going to claim that, you know, it is their property that these are their shows. So you may not see those shows on Disney Plus and on Hulu, at least initially. But I think because of the popularity of the actors and actresses who have played the characters of Luke Cage, Jessica Jones, and others, I think you're going to see those characters eventually go to either other television shows or end up on the Disney Plus platform in some form or another. Also remember, it was originally projected that the Defenders unit of characters, Daredevil, Luke Cage, Jessica Jones, Iron Fist would eventually be in movies. There was conjecture that the Punisher character would eventually be in movies. Well, we still haven't gotten there yet. And from what I understand, those actors, they there's nothing in their contracts that says that they can't work with Marvel. Just because it, those shows were on Netflix, it's I'm unsure if there's any legal barriers that keeps them from working for Marvel because these are Marvel property characters. 
Marvel didn't give Netflix exclusive rights to use these characters on the show. It was a co-op effort between Marvel and Netflix. So these characters still belong to Marvel. It's not like when Marvel sold off the rights to Spider-Man, to Sony, or the rights of the X-Men in use in film and television to Fox. This is not the same. This was a co-op deal with Marvel and Netflix. So legally, Marvel can take those actors and recast them somewhere else as those same characters. Now, I don't know if they can't reference previous stories or not. We already know that Marvel has referenced Netflix characters and storylines on Freeform's Cloak and Dagger show. And we know that they've also connected Cloak and Dagger to Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. So I'm going to make the assumption that they are allowed to reference those storylines. And I think that's where you're going to eventually see. I think you're going to see the actors and actresses who played the characters from the Netflix Marvel shows eventually end up on other Marvel shows like Cloak and Dagger or The Runaways, which is, by the way, on Hulu, or on Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or possibly in movies along with other miniseries that are going on Disney+. Plus. Remember, Disney Plus is going to come out with a Loki miniseries as well as a Wanda Maximoff Scarlet Witch miniseries off the bat. So we know that, Mar- that Marvel and Disney are already working on their own content library when it comes to the new Disney Plus platform. And in some ways, it'll be better and or more user-friendly than what DC Universe is doing. Because at the end of the day, the problem with the digital platforms is that some of the outlets for you to watch these shows on have not had the apps available yet. And the conversation in the media market is that Disney Plus will be getting to things like PlayStation and to smart TVs, hopefully, at least Disney hopes, before Disney, before DC's Universe app is available on those same platforms. We'll have to wait and see where that race ends up for those two rivals. Topic number three on episode 35 of the Mutant Blitz podcast. George St. Pierre, the longtime UFC welterweight champion, has finally announced his retirement. It seems like this was something that was a long time coming. He went into a semi-retirement years ago, and there was a lot of conjecture about the reasons why he did. But to be fair to George, I think a lot of people questioned how long he really wanted to keep fighting. Back in 2013, he looked tired. He looked like he has really spent you know, physically and emotionally and maybe even mentally at that point. When he came back to fight Michael Bisping back in 2017, the theory was is that he was going to go to a more physically natural weight class. So weight cut down the world's weight was always a hard weight cut for George, a guy who was a highly aspiring athlete, someone who had bigger ambitions than just being a fighter. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's just the reality of who he was. He wanted to be in movies. He had talked about possibly wrestling for the Canadian team in the Olympics. So he had other things on his mind. Now, since then, he was forced to vacate the title due to the fact that he would not defend the middleweight belt. And the middleweight division has kind of been a bit of a chaotic situation ever since. Similarly, the UFC welterweight belt has exchanged hands a few times since George left. And at this point, George St. Pierre will go down as one of the greatest MMA fighters of all time. He definitely has earned that distinction. But the problem with St. Pierre is that during his welterweight reign that was concurrent between losing the belt once to Matt Serra from 2006 all the way up to 2013, George St. Pierre won the most dominant runs in mixed martial arts history in terms of defending his belt and also doing so in a way that, frankly, was not very entertaining for many MMA fans. George St. Pierre went through a stretch of his career where he had seven straight decision wins. He went almost a decade in between stoppage victories from his technical knockout corner stoppage victory over BJ Penn, all the way to his rear naked choke submission of Michael Bisbang. It was almost 10 years apart 
when those type of wins happen. I've heard people say that George St. Pierre is, if not the greatest, one of the greatest MMA fighters of all time. And I think that's revisionist history for two reasons. One, you go back and look at George's record. Yes, he was 9-2 and two in his career versus former MMA champions. His only two losses, one was to another longtime welterweight champion, Matt Hughes, and the other one was to underdog victory, Matt Serra, when he upset George St. Pierre. Outside of those two losses, George beat every champion who walked in, former champion of any other organization walked in front of him. He beat UFC middleweight champion Michael Bisping. He beat former Strike Force champion Nate Diaz. He beat former WEC champion Carlos Conda. He beat former Strike Force champion Jake Shield. He beat former UFC lightweight champion BJ Penn. And he beat Matt Hughes as well after losing to him earlier in his career. He also beat Sean Shirk, who was also a former champion. So all these champions who walked into the octagon with George St. Pierre and lost. But the way he beat them was not in a dominant manner. In fact, some people believe that his final defense of the welterweight championship, a split decision victory over Johnny Hendricks, that he potentially lost that fight. There are accusations against him back in 2009 during his fight against BJ Penn that he was greasing. George St. Pierre has had some controversy hanging over him during his fighting career. Whether justified or not, he does not have a blemishless record, especially during his title runs, especially when he was in the same era as Anderson Silva, who went through his long dominant reign at middleweight, and Anderson wasn't just beating people by decision. He was knocking out the likes of Victor Belfort. He was submitting guys like Chael Sonnen. He was moving up to 205 and taking out former UFC light heavyweight champion Forrest Griffin. He beat Rich Franklin twice. Anderson Silva, yeah, Silva's record now is 6-4-1 because he lost to Chris Weidman twice and he lost at a elevated age to a guy like a Daniel Cormier. So Silva's record has been blemished. George went out of his way to make sure he didn't fight certain people that would blemish his record. Guys like BJ Penn and Anderson Silva believed in the idea that I will fight anywhere, anytime, anyone. George wouldn't do that. There were multiple times that there were discussions for George to fight certain people and he never got around to it. Whether it was justified or not, George has a laundry list of wins that realistically people wonder, did he really win the fight or did he just lay on top of the guy long enough to get the victory? He, When he fought guys like Jake Seald and Josh Koscheck and Dan Hardy, three guys who had almost no answers for him, a guy like a Tiago Alves realistically wasn't fully prepared for what was coming at him, and a guy like Nick Diaz some people even feel to this day maybe it was overhyped that matchup and that Diaz was never as good as he was thought out to be. But when Johnny Hendricks rocked George St. Pierre multiple times and people walked away from that fight thinking that Johnny had won, the theory was that George had to come back and redefend his belt. George instead decided to vacate the belt instead of defending it against the one guy who looked like who had come closest in years to defeating him. Between 2007 and 2013, most people believed that George St. Pierre had not gotten in any kind of danger of losing a fight. But part of that was because he took a very safe route. I'm not saying that what he did was wrong, but what I'm saying is when you compare him to other great champions, guys like John Jones and Daniel Cormier, who for all sorts of purposes have also dominated their opponents, but have not gone the decision with all of them, or former contemporaries like Anderson Silva and BJ Penn, who are willing to fight anyone, anytime, any place. And yes, Silva has four losses and one no contest, along with BJ Penn having eight losses against former champions. They were willing to get into more fights they could potentially lose than George was. So you could argue that George's record is a little bit more like Floyd Mayweather's record 
than it is Manny Pacquiao's. In the boxing world, many people believe that Floyd Mayweather has handpicked his opponents to keep his record pristine. Some people could make the same argument about George St. Pierre, that this is a guy who purposely picked fights with Dan Hardy, Tiago Alves, and Nick Diaz, knowing that those three guys may not be able to handle what George is bringing to the octagon. And when it was suggested that guys like Condit and Shields and Koscheck had the physical ability to counter what George could do in the octagon, George proved that he was a superior athlete. So he was always in a position, whether it was against Diaz, Condit, Shields, Koscheck, Hardy, Alves, John Fitch, that he was always going to be the better fighter. It was only against guys like BJ Penn, Matt Hughes, Matt Serra, and Johnny Hendricks that people actually wondered, would he lose? And in all those cases, he found a way to beat them at least one of two times, if not multiple times. When he came back four years later, George St. Pierre moved up the middleweight Something that something that people had assumed he was going to do eventually because George had been putting on more and more size as an athlete and a fighter. He was just building onto his physique, becoming a stronger, more explosive athlete. But we find out that after the Bisbing fight, that George bloated himself up in weight to fight at 185 instead of doing it in a healthy manner. There were a lot of talks that he was eating junk food, that he was not eating a healthy diet to gain weight. He wasn't just eating a lot of chicken and rice. He was potentially going to places like McDonald's and eating their food. And it caused him to have a major digestive issue that caused him to have a lot of negative side effects from the bloating of weight. And that's why he couldn't defend the UFC middleweight title because he was dealing with health issues that were the direct result of him trying to gain weight too quickly in order to be so-called the same size as UFC 185ers. Because remember, when you're an MMA fighter, you may cut down, for example, to 185, but you probably walk around between 205 and 215. By the time your training camp is done, you're probably weighing around 190 pounds, and the final five pounds are usually something between excess water weight and something that a dietitian can help program you to wind your way down. But during the offseason, most fighters are walking around roughly about 20 pounds heavier than they naturally are. And when George was cutting down to 170, he was walking around at 190, 195. So in order for him to think, in his mind at least, that he would be the same size as a Michael Bisping or any other bay else at 185, being 195 to him wasn't a big enough size. And he had a hard weight cut. He had some horrible health after math dealing with GI tract issues because he ate so unhealthy and he did it the wrong way. That violated his contract. His specific contract with the UFC for his comeback was stated that he was supposed to defend the title no matter what. George signed that contract in good faith and immediately violated it, not in good faith. And I don't blame Dana White and the UFC for being very frustrated with him. There was a lot of talk that George was going to have a super fight recently with Khabib Nagamenov. And it seems like that George was unwilling to wait for Khabib to come out of his most recent suspension that rooted from him getting into an after-fight altercation with people from Conor McGregor's camp. And while I think a lot of people would have been interested to see that Khabib fight, I don't know if George would have been the George St. Pierre we knew from the past. Khabib right now is in the prime of his career, and George is only roughly a year and change removed from a very bad GI track issue that for all intents and purposes was the doing of his own creation. And I'm not 100% sure that if, if he tried to cut down the 170 or 165 for this super fight, that he would have actually made it all the way down and been able to do it in a healthy manner. And even if he didn't make the weight cut, that he would be 100% on fight night. He might have been so drained and depleted from the weight cut that Khabib would be able to dominate him. And I think George knew that as well. I think George understood that he has done some damage to his body and that 
you know, maybe the four years off from MMA, he, you know, he may have stayed in the, in the gym. He may have kept training. He may have been training hard as an athlete. He wasn't training his body nutritionally to handle weight cuts and weight gains and losses like he had for the majority of his life. Remember, when you, when you handle your physiology and your nutrition the same way for 10 years, and then one day you're no longer doing it, then four years later you try to get back into that mode, sometimes it's not like riding a bike. Sometimes your body doesn't respond the same way at age 36 as it would at age 31 and 32. The body changes, the body develops, the body morphs as you get older and what you do and don't do with it physically. And if you, if your body has a negative reaction to how you handle your nutrition, that is something that is very hard to bounce back from, especially within a couple of years that could take more than a couple of years to respond back from physically. That's why Daniel Cormier said, look, I want to fight at light heavyweight for as long as I can because he understood that he had a small window because of his body and because of his genetics to make that weight cut and do it in a way that was effective. We've seen a lot of fighters who have made a weight cut a couple times, but as they gain strength, as they gain explosiveness, as they build their physiology, muscle weighs more than fat and they're unable to cut the amount of fat and water necessary to get down to a weight. Guys like Darren Till, guys like Anthony Johnson, and other MMA fighters, they have a long history of having weight cut issues because as they built their body, the muscle was the main dominant weight when they were having the cut. And of course, you really can't cut muscle at that point without doing irreparable damage to not just your physical health, but also your mental health. So I'm not saying that George St. Pierre isn't a great fighter, but I'm saying that I think that people have blown him out of proportion because it's so easy to only remember what people tell you about him. As someone who covered MMA during the peak of the George St. Pierre era, I can tell you that there were a lot of people who felt like he was avoiding certain fights, We know that behind the scenes, he was very difficult for the UFC to negotiate with. He was very picky about who he was willing to fight, where he was willing to fight. There were a lot of times that fighters might not be able to get a visa to go to Canada, or they might not be a working visa to go to Canada, or fighters didn't want to fight him in Canada, and he insisted they had to fight in Canada. If you remember, he went through a stretch where he only fought in Canada from... December 2010 to March 2013, he refused to fight in the United States. He would only fight in Canada. Now, some people say, well, he's earned that right. But if you look at guys like Anderson Silva, again, I'll fight you anywhere, anytime, any place. BJ Penn is from Hawaii. The UFC never brought a pay-per-view event to Hawaii. They made BJ Penn go to Las Vegas, go to the main 48. You look at other champions from other countries, they were always willing to fight anywhere, anytime, any place. When Bisbing lost his middleweight title to George St. Pierre, it was in New York City. It wasn't in London. It wasn't in Europe. Bisbing was never given the opportunity to defend his belt multiple times in his home country, the same way George St. Pierre insisted that he had to fight again and again and again in Canada. In fact, George St. Pierre, some people theorized, believed, He was unbeatable in Canada because of the fact that from 2005 to the end of his career, he was undefeated when fighting in Canada. So maybe George is a little superstitious as well, but either way, it's very convenient that the two cities that George lost in, he lost to Matt Hughes in Atlantic City and he lost to Matt Serra in Houston, Texas. He never fought in those towns again. Now, some people may say that may have been a scheduling issue with the UFC, but some people may also conjecture that George St. Pierre was a little suspicious and he made things difficult for the UFC and his opponents to fight him as he was middleweight champion. Again, a guy like Anderson Silva was willing to fight anyone, anytime, anywhere, any place. BJ Penn, 
same deal. John Jones, for all intents and purposes, hasn't avoided anybody. He's had all comers. He's dealt with Victor Belfort. He's dealt with Chael Sonnen. He's dealt with Daniel Cormier. He's dealt with everybody. The only person people think that he may have, quote unquote, avoided was Anthony Johnson. And honestly, considering the fact that John Jones spent a, a huge chunk of his light heavyweight reign using recreational drugs and on PEDs, it's hard to know how much of an insane, stable mind he was to even make decisions half the time, especially considering he's the same guy who several years ago got into a hit and run accident, almost killed a pregnant woman, and he ran back to his car, not for his ID, but for his drugs. So you're going to tell me that John Jones is always in the right state of mind to make decisions? Probably not. I don't think Jones ever avoided anybody. I think John fought whoever the UFC put in front of him and said, bring it on. And I think Daniel Cormier is the same way. I think Anderson Silva is the same guy. BJ Penn, the same. There's a plethora of MMA fighters who would willing to fight anyone, anytime, anywhere. And George St. Pierre didn't have that reputation. So for me, he is not one of the, he is not the greatest MMA fighter of all time. If you want to say he's top five, okay, fine. But in my book, Anderson Silva is the greatest MMA fighter of all time. And I'm not even a huge Anderson fan, but I respect the greatness. He was in, when Anderson was at his peak, he would have beaten anybody. Anderson, actually, there was conversation that he wanted to go into boxing to fight Roy Jones Jr. And frankly, with his hand speed, he probably could have made it a competitive, not a winning fight for him. On the flip side, he was willing to have a super fight with George St. Pierre when they were both in their primes. He was willing to cut down to 182 or 180 even because he always had a very easy cut for all types of purposes to 185. And for George, he would have fought him at a heavier weight and not had George had to cut so much weight. Well, George was unwilling to do it. Convenient. We never got to see, quote unquote, two of the greatest MMA fighters of all time because one guy was unwilling to fight him and the other guy was willing to cut down to wait to fight him. See, it's easier to move up in weight than it is to drop weight. You're asking Anderson Silva, the king of the 185 pound division, to meet you halfway and you're unwilling? That's a negative against GSP. To me, Anderson Silva is the greatest. John Jones and Cormier have to be in that conversation as well. I think Demetrius Johnson has to be in the conversation among the greats of all time as well. Also, you got to throw in guys like Stipe Miocic. There's a lot of MMA fighters who have come through the game over the last 20 years who deserve to be in that conversation. Anyone who tells you that GSP is by far the greatest fighter of all time, they're biased. Look, Ariel Hawani may be very popular, but he's also Canadian. He has a built-in bias for George St. Pierre because of his relationships and his friendships with the guy. And there's other MMA analysts and journalists who favor GSP because they're either wrestlers or they've trained with him or they like him as a human being. George St. Pierre may be the greatest human being on earth. I've heard all kinds of stories about how GSP has helped people who needed money, people who needed food. I know all kinds of stories about how he's going out of his way to help training partners with training camps. I've heard tons of stories about how he's taken young fighters under his wing at the gym and taught them things and helped them in ways that even their own coaches would not spend that much time with them. George is a generous, wonderful human being. But as an MMA fighter, he is not one of the greatest of all time. Being a wonderful human being is not the same as being one of the greatest athletes of all time. Just like because you're a great athlete doesn't make you a great human being. There's tons of stories about how Michael Jordan is a horrible tipper when it comes to golf and other activities. And he's a bit of a snob. But people consider him the greatest basketball player of all time. Being great at a profession or a sport is not the same level as being a great human being. And I think George St. Pierre is not the greatest MMA fighter of all time because he misses out on the prerequisite of martial art greatness. Anytime, anywhere, any place. That's the fighter's code. GSP was more of an athlete, a professional athlete 
in the millennial modern sense, then he is a pure mixed martial artist. He's still one of the five greatest fighters of all time. But if you're telling me he's one, two, or three, I can't accept that argument. Topic number four on episode 35 of the Mutant Blitz podcast. I want to talk a little bit of a kind of like a check-in on the CW television show's ratings. And the reason why I'm specifically addressing the ratings is because about a year ago when I first started the Mutant Blitz podcast, one of the things we talked about was the amount of people and the growing demographic of viewers when it comes to superhero television and movie shows. As someone who is a consumer of these shows myself, I can tell you from experience that it's interesting to watch the evolutions of these shows and the quality of contents being put on and how people react to that content. The CW has kind of become the home of the supernatural, extraordinary, extraterrestrial kind of television programming from shows like The Flash to Riverdale to Arrow, Supernatural, Supergirl, Charmed, Black Lightning, Legacies, Legends of Tomorrow, Dynasty, and others. Frankly, it is it is the network of the odd without being science fiction. It doesn't go all the way to sci-fi level, but it gets pretty darn close. And the CW has had a lot of success viewership-wise, specifically with their superhero shows. The Flash has been the number one show on the CW for a long, long time. And as a result, it has encouraged the CW to keep renewing these shows. Now, at this time last year, Black Lightning made its debut, and it seemed like Black Lightning was going to be the next big show on the CW because of how well it did in the ratings. Also, the Arrow, the Arrow television show, the original forerunner of the superhero shows in their modern incarnation, was dropping in ratings. Supergirl was kind of holding steady in their ratings. And I had told you last year that it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next 9 to 12 months because of the fact that with these superhero shows, audiences are evolving. They're evolving in their interests. They're evolving in how much they want to consume and what they want to consume. And now with many, many options, we talked about Netflix. We talked about Hulu. Also, DC Universe has their own shows on that platform. You have Freeform with Cloak and Dagger. You have Hulu with The Runaways. Also, Netflix come out with a new show, The Umbrella Academy, which is kind of Netflix's way of filling the void of not having any new Marvel television shows on their platform. That kind of programming is going to be popping up more and more on Netflix. So you have more options than you ever had before. So there's a constant competition for viewers. And something that CW has realized is that they and CBS television network who have the same parent company Viacom they understand that it's more than just about having television viewers but the DVR viewers and on demand viewers are just as important as the live viewing audience so when the flash is the most watched show on the CW averaging about 1.79 million viewers that's not just people watching it live. That's people watching on DVR. That's people watching on demand. That's people watching on the CW app. If you notice, CBS Network is pushing their CBS All Access programming often, more and more often because of the fact they understand that as people cut the cord, people want to get their CW content somewhere. And if people don't want Netflix and they don't want Hulu, they could just get CBS All Access and get to watch everything from their CBS network. And the CW has their own original content as well on the CW app. So these networks understand that viewership is more than just the television rating numbers. And as a result, when you look at the rating numbers, you realize that part of the reason why they're keeping some of the shows and ending others is more than just a ratings increase or decrease. For example, the television show Charmed, which is in its first season in its new in its new version on the CW, has held steady in its rating numbers consistently through the year. It's not really spiked or dropped, but its on-demand numbers are much higher than their live programming watching. 
despite the fact that The Flash has dropped 18% in television viewing, it has increased in number of viewers digitally. So The Flash's audience has consistently been there. Interestingly enough, The Arrow has increased its viewership. Television viewership for The Arrow has increased by 2%, but its digital and playback viewership has increased more than double that. So The Arrow, despite the fact there's a lot of conjecture this might be the last year for The Arrow television show, has gained more viewers. But as people are watching The Flash and The Arrow, they're watching less of the other superhero shows. And this is an interesting trend to watch. Supergirl and the Black Lightning are the two biggest victims. Supergirl has taken a 20% hit in live and DVR television audiences. Part of it is because it's on a new night. It's on Sunday nights now. It's no longer during the week. So you could argue some people are still trying to find the program. But it's interesting enough that for the digital audience, it's gone down as well. And I explained this before that people turn on these shows to escape reality, not to be preached to. And there's a little bit of preachiness that goes on in Supergirl that I think certain audiences don't want to deal with. They want to turn on their shows. If there's a message in the show, let it be there. Don't force it down the audience's throat. Black Lightning has taken the biggest dip of the superhero shows. A 41% drop in viewership is the now the worst viewership between TV rating and digital viewership of all the superhero shows. Superhero shows being The Flash, The Arrow, Supergirl, and DC Legends of Tomorrow. And with Batwoman coming out later this year for its debut on the big on the on the big scene of the CW, it's going to be interesting to see what the long term sustainability of Black Lightning is. Black Lightning had phenomenal ratings last year, both on digital and linear television. But I think part of that was because It came out perfect timing. It was right around when Black Panther, the movie, had come out. And it was also right around the time that production had started for the second season of Luke Cage. And with the success of Luke Cage on Netflix, which we find out now that Luke Cage's two seasons on Netflix were among the highest viewed Netflix shows of the last several years. And among the superhero shows, it was actually third. It's healthy viewership probably looked at Black Lightning and said, well, maybe this is DC's version. And I think that the CW and DC tried to position Black Lightning that way. Not that the show is good or bad because of that. But listen, as a marketer and as a television network, if you can take advantage of a trend in a wave and ride it, you might as well. Black Lightning, for those who don't know, is one of the oldest non-white characters in all of DC comic history. So he has a long history to feed off of when it comes to the comic book world. The problem is, is that the second season has not been able to carry the same momentum. Now, I think part of that has to do with it changing nights. I think Black Lightning had a great lead in with The Flash each and every night. And I think the Flash audience, when it went to Black Lightning, it said, well, look, I'm already used to a certain style with these shows. This isn't that far of a reach. Maybe it's a little more serious than the Flash, but I can play along with it. Well, now it's leading is the is Arrow, another serious show. So you're going from Arrow to Black Lightning to semi-serious shows. But Arrow's style visually and storytelling wise is very different than Light Black Lightning, very different than The Flash, and extremely different than Supergirl. So the audience for the Arrow is actually probably not going to watch Black Lightning predominantly. And the numbers are showing that. While the Arrow averages a few hundred thousand more people watching it live on linear television and on DVR, Black Lightning, like I said, is taking a 41% dip in viewership. DC Legends of Tomorrow, I think, though, is probably the closest to the chopping block of all the CW shows. And I kind of saw this coming over the last couple of years. The show right now is riding a wave of popularity because for the people who watch on the CW app and for the people 
who watch on digital platforms, the character of Matt Ryan's Constantine is an extremely popular character with a major cult following because of his show that was on NBC that was short-lived and because of his original programming show content that is on the CW app and on and at the CW's website. So there's a large audience for him specifically, and now he's a star on season four of DC Legends of Tomorrow and made frequent appearances in season three. That has grown their popularity on that platform, but they've lost about 26% of just the linear audience. And I think that that Monday slot it's just not working for them. I think the way people had hoped. I think that the CW is going to have to give up something if Batwoman is going to work. I never thought the CW would get to a point of oversaturation when it came to their superhero shows. I kind of always felt like the CW could have owned the superhero television market, especially with Disney buying up the Fox properties. You're not going to see The Gifted on television much longer. Gotham is in its final season on Fox. So you're elim- you're basically going to eliminate an entire entity in short form. And realistically, Marvel is only going to ever have characters, if they're not on ABC, they're going to be on Disney+, Plus. they're going to be on Freeform. It's not like you have major number of shows competing with what the CW is putting out on linear television. So for the live and DVR audiences and on-demand audiences, you don't have a ton of competition. You have competition on the digital realm more than the linear realm. But the ratings are showing that people are judging this not just as an escape anymore, but they're judging the actual substance of the programming. The seventh season of Arrow has actually turned out to be a great change of direction in terms of storytelling and in terms of substance. I And as you see, they've gained viewership again. I think the change of nights has helped a little bit as well. Going to Monday nights, while it has not been as successful as Supergirl was on the Monday night slot, Arrow has shown that the Monday night slot is a healthy slot for it. I think the problem why it didn't do it so well at first is because traditionally, you know, a lot of the Nielsen ratings have shown that the people who watch Arrow actually also watch football. So you're getting a lot of DVR viewership who people watch their live football and then they watch Arrow maybe later in the week. The Nielsen ratings show that. Whereas Supergirl's audience was not going to watch football and that's why it was more healthy in the Monday Night Slot. I understand why they moved Supergirl, though, to Sunday because they wanted to pair Supergirl with Charmed. And they wanted to give Charm a legitimate lead-in and not have Charm be the leading gun on Sunday nights. And Sunday night is fine for Supergirl because, again, the audience who watches football is not the same audience that watches Supergirl, traditionally, according to the Nielsen ratings and information. So... We know that for linear television, Supergirl should have been okay. But because Supergirl's content has become preachy at times and less storytelling and less substantive, that has led to people maybe turning off the channel and the show a little bit more than not. I think that they will give Black Lightning a little bit more of a leash because they can always change their night the next season. They don't have to keep Black Lightning following the arrow. They can always put him following the Flash moving forward. I think that what the CW should do is this. They should probably keep Supergirl on Sunday nights. They can, as long as they get some different writers in there and maybe a different showrunner, it will probably help the show evolve away from the style that's been told for the last few seasons. Season one of Supergirl was actually, for all the purposes, fun. And season two is fun as well. But season three started getting preachy and now season four has continued to be preachy with different ideologies. And I think for audiences, when they they want an escape, they don't want to be preached to. If they want to be preached to, they'll turn on their favorite, you know, political radio station, whether they're conservative or liberal. They don't want their politics mixed that deeply into their escape 
programming when it comes to comic book heroes. You know, whenever comic books dealt with issues like racism and prejudice and anything that was a social political issue, they tried to do it in a way that they let the reader make their own decisions. They weren't trying to force the reader to come to a decision. And I think that Supergirl doesn't fully understand that concept. At least the showrunners and writers don't. I think Black Lightning needs to be after the Flash. And I think Batwoman needs to be following the Arrow. I think if you pair the Arrow and Batwoman together, those are two similar shows that people can get on board with. And I think Black Lightning, if that was paired with the Flash, or if Black Lightning was staying on its own two feet somewhere on another night, I think that's where it would be most productive. But I think in that case, you have to sacrifice the DC Legends of Tomorrow. Would the CW considering making Legend of Tomorrow a digital-only show? I think that's a that's a question that I can't answer for them. But I think that's something they should consider, considering the ratings where they are. When you go all the way down to a .31 linear-wise, and you've dropped 26% from the same slot last year, and you go on almost a two-month hiatus with your show, maybe it's time to go digital-only. Or maybe the CW, maybe the producers of DC Legends Tomorrow and the CW could actually have a conversation with DC and see if maybe they can move the show to another network that would maybe be more interested in picking up. For example, Sci-Fi has shown a lot of success with their first season of Krypton. You know, maybe if you want to make DC Legends of Tomorrow a little bit more sci-fi oriented and tap into that potential audience, maybe that's where you could rejuvenate the show. And make it a little bit less CW and make it a little more sci-fi. You can get a new audience. Because it basically is a sci-fi show with the time travel and, you know, John's Constantine fighting demons and stuff like that. And that way, at least you're not sac- having to choose between Black Lightning and the C- and Legend of Tomorrow when it comes to your programming. And you can keep the pattern what they like to do, which is pairing the shows together. I think that's kind of the direction the CW probably should go in. The Flash is doing very well. It's a lot of fun. It's another great season. It's a major twist and change what their people are used to seeing. It's probably why the initial drop in the ratings have happened with season five. But I think they're going to eventually come back because all the CW shows do better in the spring than they do in the fall anyway. I think Arrow is probably coming back for season eight. Um, I think that what they've done in this season has shown that they're willing to take risks they haven't taken in a few years. And it has paid off. I think Supergirl deserves another season. I think though they need to change either some of the writers. Or or change the direction of the style of storytelling of the show. To maybe understand that the superhero audience does not want to be preached to so much. And for a show that was supposed to be with women heroes for women. They've done a very poor job at locking down their target audience. Which is supposed to be women between the ages of 18 and 42. They haven't done a great job at doing that. It's actually gotten to the point where the male to female ratio of viewers has almost gotten too close for a show that was supposed to be a female dominated audience show. And Black Lightning, I just think they have the wrong lead in. And I think that Black Lightning needs to do a crossover. I think Black Lightning needs to establish where they are in the CW Arrowverse, whether they're on another planet, whether they're on the same Earth as the Flash or Supergirl, whatever the situation is, I think that the that show needs to do a crossover with the other shows. The Arrowverse crossovers have done major benefits in the ratings for some of the other shows over the years, and I think that we've seen that Batwoman was very well received by a lot of audiences, and I think that's going to be a major boom initially with that show because of the crossover event. And I think that Black Lightning would benefit from that. And that will probably help them stabilize their viewership. The final topic here on episode 35 of the Mutant Blitz podcast. I want to address the story that came out that has not gotten a lot of attention, but I think deserves attention. And that is that the uh, Sports Business Journal analysis of NBA ratings show the NBA regional ratings are down 10% on average while their national television broadcasts on networks such as TNT are down 18%. 15 of the 28 regional sports networks that carry NBA games are all down compared to last year. And the average audience has shown major losses in terms of viewership. 
And I think this is an interesting topic because the media as a whole, the political mainstream media made a big deal about the NFL's drop in ratings, but they haven't touched the NBA's drop in ratings. And I want to address it here because I think it's a conversation that needs to be had. There is a strong explanation for why some of these networks have lose, have lost ratings and have lost viewership on such a massive scale. And I don't think it's simple enough just to say that people are not watching the NBA. I don't think that's fair at all. Here's what the problem is. First of all, let's understand these regional networks. Why are they down? Well, the Knicks are down 41% on their regional network because the team is absolutely horrible to watch. The quality of the product is going down exponentially. Fox Sports Ohio's Cavaliers ratings going 56% over the last year. Well, that dropped because LeBron James, the best player on the planet, left the Cavs and went to the Lakers. And the Cavs are a horrible watch as well. So those are two specific examples, along with Chicago, the Bulls, their ratings being down 36% regionally, that the quality of content, people just don't want to watch it. People don't want to see a bad product. And I think that's just a general concept when it comes to all viewership, whether it's, whether it's, uh, you know, episodic television, whether it is, you know, premium cable, basic cable, whatever level of your watch television watching is, you want to see good quality content. And if your team stinks, you're not going to watch them as closely as you would if they were winning every night. Now, the teams that have the best ratings in the regional markets have also seen year-to-year declines. But part of that has to do with also the fact that more and more people are cutting the cable. You see, we are talking about linear television ratings. We're not talking about digital viewers and subscribers. So as a result, the digital viewer and subscriber may still be watching the Spurs, the Thunder, and the Warriors, but they're just not watching it on their cable or satellite provider. They might be watching on NBA TV. They might be watching on YouTube TV, PlayStation View, Sling TV. They may just be watching it on another platform that is delivering them content. Also, there's a lot of people who have things like Roku and Fire Sticks. And there's a lot of ways to get content that you want in ways that have nothing to do with the cable companies. So the regional network numbers, to me, are less of an issue because... At the end of the day, the NBA is the opposite of Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball has become an extremely regionalized sport. It is not as much of a national sport until you get to the postseason. Well, for the NBA, it's the opposite. The NBA is more of a national sport and less of a regional sport. And I think that when it comes to the NBA viewer, because of things like now sports betting, fantasy basketball, and merchandise sales, and the way the popularity of the game has evolved, the NBA national audience will naturally be a bigger audience altogether and on a night-to-night basis than the regional fan base will be. Also, don't forget about the fact that the NBA season goes from... The the regular season starts in October and the NBA finals end in June. That is a nine-month stretch. And don't forget about the fact that the NBA offseason is also in the headlines all summer long with the NBA draft at the end of June... You have the free agency in July, and then the aftermath of free agency in August, leading in the training camp in September, and the sandwich in the middle is usually the summer league, where all the draftees play in. The NBA has done a good job at keeping themselves in the conversation year-round. The problem for the NBA is the fact that they don't understand that what makes the NFL great is that less is more. The NBA has actually stretched themselves too thin. And one of the reasons why TNT broadcasts are down 26% and ESPN national broadcasts are down 6% has less to do with the fact that people aren't watching the NBA. It's because of the fact that from October to December, the majority of sports fans are watching football and not basketball. So when TNT has a basketball game on Thursday night, or ESPN has a game on Friday night, they have competition from the NFL, from college football, and also 
There's a lot of high school football that is also played on Fridays and Saturdays. And people have shown in their viewership in terms of television and in terms of audience attendance that the strongest time of year for the NFL is October and November. The NBA season starts getting going in October and November. So the majority of NBA viewers are not tuning in early in the year. So when ABC starts its prime time games in January and February, we're seeing there is not a major drop off in viewers. Why? Because the NFL season is pretty much over. Football season is pretty much done. And even though the first week of the AAF had great ratings versus the NBA on the same night, the AAF has been able to not duplicate that number because the first week of the AAF was on CBS Television Network. Since then, it's been on TVT, it's been on TNT and NFL Network and CBS Sports Network. More people have access to CBS whether it's through linear and digital platforms, then they do the CBS Sports Network and the NFL Network. In fact, if you are someone who does cut the cord, in some areas, if you don't have the right service providers, you may not get NFL Network at all. If you have YouTube TV and you live in the Philadelphia area, you'll get NBC Sports Network, but you don't get NFL Network through YouTube TV. So what does that mean? What that means is that you can watch Sixer games, but you'll never see an AAF game. Why? Because if it's on CBS Sports Network and if it's on NFL Network, you may not get it through YouTube TV. You may not get it through PlayStation View. But what you will get is all these NBA games. That's on the digital platform. Linear-wise, we know that certain regional networks are not carried by certain providers. We know historically the Fox regional sports networks have been at war with Xfinity because Xfinity is now a competing company with Fox. And now that they've merged with NBC, it's almost a one-sided affair that is unfair to Fox. And it's part of the reason why Fox sold off their sports regional networks because of the fact that they realized they were in a losing battle with ESPN and with NBC slash Xfinity, also known as Comcast Universal or whatever version of the name you want to use. So while ABC and ESPN broadcasts are holding up nationally, it's the NBA TV and the TNT games that are down. And like I said, part of that has to do with the fact that the NBA season is too long and their ratings from October, November and December, they, they are extremely down compared to January, February, March. The problem for the NBA is that because their season starts in the middle of the football season, they don't get the boom that you would hope for from an early season of big matchups. So at the beginning of the year, when and all things are equal and LeBron is playing the Warriors, people may not be watching that if it's on the same night as a football game. Not because people don't want to see LeBron versus the Warriors, but because if there's a football game on at the same time, there's a large contingent of fans who will go to the football game first. Whereas LeBron's team right now is a losing record as of February 28th, them versus the Warriors will not gain a lot of viewers because people will assume that LeBron's going to lose to the Warriors because the Warriors are the best team in the NBA. So basketball, if basketball wants to get do a better job at gaining ground in the viewership department, I think they can't have their season lasting nine months. Like baseball, basketball doesn't understand that less is more. Hockey has the same problem, but hockey's issues go far beyond just the length of the season. There's a whole other laundry list of issues that we're not going to get into on this episode. But for the NBA, they should not be discouraged by the ratings issue because one, the NBA has having these bad ratings numbers during football season. Totally predictable. Number two, more and more people are cutting the cord. So linear television ratings are going down across the board. Everyone's ratings are going down. You have to judge the ratings totally differently now than you used to because you got to merge the digital and the television ratings. For example, the NFL started doing that and we're finding out 
that the NFL has never lost any viewers. In fact, the marginal decreases of viewership that people claim was because of the Kaepernick controversy or claim because of Donald Trump had nothing to do with either one. It had to do with the fact that at the same time people were cutting the cord, the NFL was not giving us the digital numbers. All of a sudden, the NFL is telling us how many people are watching these games on the NFL Network app and on Yahoo Sports app and on and on Amazon. We're finding out that, wait a minute, the viewers are not watching the NFL. They're just not watching it on linear cable or dish network television. Totally different conversation. And ESPN very smartly always releases their digital numbers. So, for example, when... The Rockets Thunder game only got a 2.0 TV rating versus the AAF. When ESPN combined their linear numbers with their digital numbers, you found out that actually almost the same number of people were watching the NBA that night that watched the NBA the year before on the same night of the week. So it's not that less people were watching is that less people were watching on linear television. Less people were watching on their cable. And as a result, the NBA didn't really lose viewers to the AAF. They lost a segment of the viewership that comes and goes anyway. Because at the end of the day, the diehard fan, if you love basketball, you're watching basketball. If you love football, you're watching football. If you love hockey, you're watching hockey. You're not leaving your team behind. You'll find a way to watch your favorite team. What has gone down for the NBA is has been their ability to keep viewers watching during the football months. That has taken the biggest hit because people are finding out that there's just as many people watching digitally football as they thought were being lost linearly. So the NBA is not rising and the NFL is falling or the NFL isn't, you know, um, you know, beating the snot out of the NBA. No, the NFL has always been television wise king it's been one of the top uh, 50 rated television shows every year for the last 10 15 years the difference is that the nba keeps trying to stretch out their season and eventually they got to make a decision if they're willing to live with the minimal returns of the first three months of the season as long as they keep getting a boom of returns from january february march and april if they're okay with that, then they'll be fine. But if they're if they look at these numbers and they say this is a concern, this is a problem, then the NBA is going to have to make the decision if it's worth it to start their season in March. I've made the argument the NBA season is too long. I think the NBA should start their season in December. I think that hockey should do the same thing. I think the fact that you're competing with the middle of the NFL season is a losing battle. Programming wise, it's not smart. The only thing that's more dumb is the fact that the Stanley Cup will schedule their Stanley Cup games on the same night as the NBA Finals. And hockey wonders why nobody's watching them. Because everybody's watching the NBA, you idiots. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Mutant Bliss Podcast. If you have any thoughts on the content I brought you today on the podcast, you can drop a comment in the section below. If you liked what we had to bring you on the podcast, hit that like button, hit subscribe, keeps the episode each and every week. Over the next few months, we will be reviewing we will be reviewing the Captain Marvel movie that comes out, as well as Shazam and Avengers, Endgame, all that and more in the next few months, right here on the Mutant Blitz podcast, as well as my thoughts and perspectives, deep dives on the world of sports. I'm your host, Josh Hennig, and I'll catch you on the next episode of the Mutant Blitz podcast. <laughs>